So welcome, Professor Ferenc Herscher, to this episode of In Search of Europe. Professor Ferenc is a political philosopher and a philosopher of art. He teaches at the National University of Public Service in Budapest, Hungary, and has just published a book called Art and Politics in Roger Scruton's Conservative Philosophy. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. Well, I'm happy to be with you. Could you please introduce this book that you've just written and perhaps tell us why aesthetics are important in Roger's conservative philosophy? Yes, so thanks again for the uh, opportunity. I'm happy to discuss uh, Roger Scruton and my recent book on him because he was uh, a great man, a great philosopher, and a great friend of uh, my country, Hungary. And all of them uh, has to be taken into account when we try to assess his uh, merits and his achievements. He was uh, basically a Cambridge-educated uh, aesthetician, a philosopher of art, as well as uh, an analytical philosopher, generally speaking, and in particular, also a philosopher of uh, politics, of uh, political philosophy. But uh, what I tried to do in this book was to combine these two rather diverse interests of his, i.e. to see how his views on art and his views on politics uh, connected, although they never uh, got uh, mixed up, and that's important, I think. They had uh, uh, been in the, his uh, philosophy ever, uh, since he started uh, uh, with his uh, PhD on aesthetics. And he finished up on a combination of the two, which actually leads up uh, as uh, uh, readers of his work to religion, to the philosophy of uh, religion and metaphysics. So these, these are the issues that come up uh, in my book, but we can, of course, uh, uh, go into details to to make it uh, more easily um, understandable to the um, listener. What do you think inspired him? Who were the thinkers he was reading that got him to start thinking about aesthetics as a philosophical subject? Yes, uh, well, aesthetics in Cambridge had a special status, uh, and uh, within analytical philosophy, it was uh, quite uh, in its um, uh, rising uh, state. And uh, the, the special uh, fortune for uh, Roger was that he got to Peter House, which is one of the oldest and, and uh, uh, most curious uh, colleges of uh, Cambridge. Why? Because it preserved some of its uh, uh, conservative uh, credentials. And another uh, important thing was for him to meet, meet uh, David Watkin, who was a young um, uh, fellow of that uh, college, and who was an art historian who rebelled against his own uh, supervisor, Pefsner, and therefore uh, uh, returned to what uh, he claimed was classical architecture, the principles of classical architecture. And the two of them, David Watkin and Roger, talked a lot about uh, modernism, the failure of, uh, especially of modern architecture within urban centers all around Europe. And also uh, his other uh, major interest in art about music, classical music. And that's, uh, that's I think, one of the background that needs to be uh, seen. Another one is uh, his interest uh, in uh, literature. He uh, was uh, uh, a published uh, uh, novel writer as well as someone uh, who was interested in the history of British novel or, or English uh, language uh, novel writing. And uh, he was also interested in literary history, literary theory, and uh, uh, specifically F.R. Leavis, who was a great... Uh, 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 well, uh, leading light of of uh, a sort of uh, a, a literary history, which connected it to uh, social life, to um, social history and cultural history generally. So, in a way, 
For Roger, art was never an individual endeavor. It was always something that you experience in common with others. Now, there's, there are several things you've said there that remind me of something that I think is at the heart of the complexity of trying to understand Roger's work. And that is that he was trained in an analytical tradition, but he was also inspired by the German idealists. And they seem to be at, at a loggerheads usually. But he also said that he is well received in Hungary. And I wonder, how do you see this juxtaposition between him being an English philosopher, working in an English tradition, but who seems to have been received more outside on outside of England on the continent because he was had studied the you know Hegel and Kant primarily. Well, uh, of course, this is a topic that we discussed earlier, so uh, the listener has to be aware that uh, this is something which is close to our heart as well, because uh, indeed, uh, Roger was an ex exceptional uh, analytical philosopher in that he was uh, well versed in uh, continental philosophy, basically German, but also French and other traditions, uh, and in particular, uh, well versed in British uh, idealism and its uh, predecessors, German idealism. And that's something uh, which one has to keep in mind. So he has a much wider uh, vision of uh, the role of art than uh, what is uh, uh, more natural for analytical philosophers who take it as an analytical um, tool, uh, art, and also an analytical object but not something that one should uh, consider uh, as wide as culture and, and uh, social matters are concerned. But, uh, but for, for Roger, that was uh, from the beginning an issue. Uh, yes, he was, uh, first of all, a Kantian, uh, which means that for him, aesthetics, the, the philosophy of art, was uh, something that was uh, uh, established uh, by, by this German philosopher as we know it nowadays, and also uh, the, the the reason why he was interested in Kant was that he shared his vision of the human being, as well as his vision of the role and functioning of philosophy. Both of them are important. Um, his uh, Kant's philosophy is uh, 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 for Roger something that divides or or that has two levels, two dimensions. Uh, we are animals, we have got our animal instincts and animal nature, but we are something well beyond our animal nature. We are uh, homo sapiens, we are thinking people, thinking uh, uh, beings, and that means that we uh, establish uh, another world beyond the natural uh, and biologically determined world, the world of freedom, and the world of free uh, 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 reflection. So that's that's the Kantian uh, 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 understanding of human nature that is crucial for him. He wrote about that issue all in his book on human nature from 2017. But he also wrote a, a short monograph on Kant himself. Yet uh, I uh, keep emphasizing uh, that he was also uh, inspired by Hegel. And Hegel, of course, while also belonging to the German idealist tradition, was himself a critique and, in fact, uh, a rather harsh or sharp critique of, uh, of, of Kant in uh, one uh, special aspect, i.e. Uh, to look at uh, the phenomenon of the world in a historical perspective. And it, this means uh, partly uh, human history, uh, i.e. Um, the history of politics and uh, social life, but also the history of what he called the Geist, the spirit, which uh, was uh, a much larger dimension. Uh, in fact, uh, the dimension of uh, a metaphysical uh, statute. And uh, within the, the history of uh, the spirit, the human spirit itself finds its place and, uh, and role. And al although uh, uh, Scruton was not uh, fully uh, uh, endorsing that sort of uh, uh, philosophy of history that was uh, 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 um, 
you know, as a critique uh, developed by Hegel, uh, as a critique of Kant, yet uh, he was aware that uh, that Kant's uh, uh, philosophy was ahistorical in at least the systematic pieces, and that it requires a sort of uh, approach uh, which uh, which opens it up to the historical and the, the, the transcendental dimension. I wonder if there's a third potential influence here from the continent, which is the phenomenological tradition, and in what sense that might have inspired Roger, and also how the concept of cognitive dualism, which he employed in, in talking about aesthetics, where does that fit in, do you think, uh, in the inspiration? Uh, sort of where does it come from, and how did Roger use that in, in his philosophy? Yes, uh, from Hegel, it's quite easy to connect to, uh, at least to German phenomenology. Of course, there is a French direction beyond it. Uh, uh, we can go into that as well. But but for the sake of brevity, I think it's important to see that the German uh, idealists uh, had a major influence on phenomenology. This is a 20th century school in Germany uh, with uh, uh, people like Scheler, Galen and others. And the issue there is, and of course, it has a connection actually to uh, religious thought, uh, because uh, what it tells us is that uh, the human being is not to be understood as uh, in uh, major liberal theories, uh, i.e. that uh, we are autonomous beings who are free and responsible uh, without uh, any uh, constraints. But uh, it presents the human being as, uh, by definition, by its very birth, uh, uh, an interpersonal being, I that uh, our identity is formed through interaction. We are talking now with you, Carl Gustav, and we are uh, in a constant exchange of our ideas in that uh, discussion, and that helps us to understand ourselves better. And that's the point uh, that comes up in Hegel's uh, famous discussion of the master-slave relationship, and that's taken over by the uh, by uh, partly by actually uh, the the uh, Husserlian uh, source of uh, phenomenology, but then it's taken uh, uh, over and and developed in uh, uh, a way that uh, un helps us to understand the human being as transactional being, as someone who is in a constant uh, um, a dialogue with others and who finds his or herself in that very dialogue. Uh, I, we are uh, not uh, uh, autonomous in the sense that we would be closed up into our own mind. We are uh, uh, only... Uh, making sense of our life in connection with uh, our interactions with others. And that's uh, that's crucial if we want to understand art, because art is, in fact, a form of communication, a form of uh, a dialogue between uh, uh, the, the, the artist uh, or the work of art, which, which uh, expresses the artist's view, in a dialogue with the, with the listener, with the audience uh, who tries to make sense of it. And this sort of dialogue that is uh, uh, taking place in the in the artistic uh, experience was crucial for uh, for Roger because it opens up a third dimension. Uh, it's not only about uh, the individual himself herself, the, the the listener or the member of the audience. It's neither uh, simply about the artist or the work of art uh, for its own sake. But the two of them, the dialogue between the two of them, uh, opens up the field of something that is um, way beyond uh, our own uh, experiences in the, the natural world, which is uh, the, the, the metaphysical dimension, uh, which uh, Scruton always uh, tried to, uh, to uh, uh, catch, but he was always aware that it's not possible as a Kantian he was uh, certain that uh, philosophy cannot reach beyond um, uh, what is conceptually uh, uh, formed, and that's uh, not uh, the metaphysical experience. But art 
the experience of art help us uh, to get that uh, a grasp of something which is beyond our um, everyday experience. And that's uh, that was crucial for Roger because it led him to an understanding of uh, metaphysics and of the divine. Yes, exactly. And and here, well, when he talks about beauty in the very short introduction, the Oxford very short introduction to beauty, and also in his documentary, Why Beauty Matters, this concept of beauty becomes central in his thought. And I want to ask you how he uses that concept. But I want to ask you more specifically just on what you've said now about the metaphysics. In that book on beauty, Roger seems to deny the possibility of beauty in the way that Plato would have seen it. In other words, as a substitute, uh, we, we look at something that is individually beautiful in order to reach a universal concept of beauty. And Roger seems to have had difficulties with that because of his Kantian understanding. But how does he employ this concept of beauty in, in his philosophy? Well, of course, that's another question uh, that you open up here, Carl Gustav, because, of course, we have to understand uh, that uh, Roger, as an eclectic thinker, uh, took uh, many inspirations uh, and different ones. And you mentioned that uh, he has got some problems with uh, Plato, but uh, I would uh, also uh, add to that that he was very much inspired by Plato, as uh, we see in the, in the dialogues that he writes uh, which were uh, intellectual endeavors, I mean, uh, literary endeavors, but also um, uh, uh, sort of present day uh, uh, confrontations or, or uh, dialogues with, with Plato. But to answer your question, uh, in his short book on beauty, what he presents us is uh, a kind of um, uh, layers, uh, the different layers that uh, one can uh, uh, find uh, or, or, or meet uh, with the beautiful in, in one's life. He starts up from ordinary human experiences, from uh, the, 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 the beautiful of nature, um, uh, of the human body, of erotic love, in fact, but also of um, just uh, simply ordering our uh, 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 rooms uh, at, uh, and trying to uh, cover uh, the table uh, with the nice cloths and and uh, the ceramics that uh, that might uh, uh, make it uh, look uh, uh, nicer and more comfortable and homely. That's very important. That uh, for him, the beautiful also uh, connects uh, to the orderly, and through that, to the idea of finding a home in the world. That's because, uh, uh, as he understands, the human being. Uh, confronts uh, a chaotic uh, world uh, first, and uh, he and uh, has to make sense of that world by trying to make order in it. And uh, in our uh, 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 very environment, uh, in our homes, what we do is uh, to keep order in order to feel uh, homely, to feel comfortable. So beauty is. Uh, a requirement for us for this very practical uh, uh, reasons and in this very practical context. But then he builds up uh, uh, his um, uh, layers and, and tries to show us that it's not only uh, this, uh, this everyday beauty that, uh, that counts, but there are artistic forms of beauty, like in our uh, artistic uh, uh, experiences and also in our experience of um, uh, architecture in our daily life we usually live in in villages and towns which were built by human beings and uh, these are the wider um, uh, environment for us and there again we are looking for order and uh, and uh, homeliness and that's uh, why we there again look for beauty but beauty uh, is something uh, which is uh, um, uh, uh, comforting, but it is also something which uh, uh, addresses us and which uh, 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 opens up uh, in us uh, uh, questions. And that way, the aesthetic uh, experience is in fact uh, showing us that uh, that uh, 
there might be something beyond uh, our ordinary experiences and the the, the that is of course um, uh, the the beautiful which is uh, beyond uh, and, uh, our own grasp uh, this is perhaps connected already to the sublime that's another concept that uh, is uh, famously discussed by by authors like Kant uh, going back actually to the ancients uh, and uh, through this discussion of uh, the beautiful and the sublime we can in fact uh, uh, understand uh, the human condition as something which has got a transcendental dimension and you are right that of course uh, uh, philosophically conceptually to grasp that dimension of the human being the imago dei uh, aspect of the human being that we are all created by god with uh, uh, and in the image of god that sort of uh, 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 divine origin cannot conceptually uh, be uh, demonstrated or or proved uh, and that's why uh, uh, scrutiny is somewhat hesitant in in his philosophy as far as substantial metaphysics is concerned but i think that in his later work and uh, primarily in the face of that and in the soul of the world uh, he achieves a description of the human uh, experience of the human phenomenon which has got this uh, transcendental dimension as a, a, a prerequisite of of the human being as as something that is foundational in the human uh, phenomenon and therefore uh, i would claim that by the end of his life he becomes aware of that uh, transcendental dimension which is beyond uh, the conceptually uh, grasp uh, 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 natural environment which is uh, the primary target of science uh, and uh, the tra primary tra target of analytical philosophy i think one thing that strikes readers of roger's work is how versatile he was he wrote about many aspects of culture right he wrote about wine he wrote about art, he wrote about music, but he also wrote about nature and conservation of nature and, and the countryside and these types of um, questions. So I think one could say his outlook on life was very aesthetic. And I'm wondering, how do you see this connecting with his political philosophy? Or to rephrase the question, how does one invite the aesthetic into the political? That's an interesting question, because recently I got this uh, possible criticism that uh, uh, perhaps we uh, can understand uh, Roger's work as uh, something like a cultural conservatism or as uh, an aesthetics of uh, conservatism, which uh, is a, a criticism in the sense that then the, the dimension of the political is... Uh, mistaken or or, or uh, left out of the picture but that's not the case i would say i think that uh, uh, roger belonged to those uh, philosophers as a political philosopher who appreciated the british tradition and within that british tradition pragmatism practical experience and prudence but he was also quite uh, uh, well uh, educated in legal history, in British uh, and in particular in English political uh, 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 legal history, culture is upstream from from politics. That's the issue that he had to realize, uh, partly because he experienced the political life in communist countries as well as uh, uh, in the in the Near East and in many other contexts. He realized that uh, that uh, politics cannot be, you know. Uh, universalized uh, and and uh, and um, abstracted. It's something that develops in very particular contexts. I uh, that is something which uh, is um, uh, very much uh, constrained by culture and by uh, social matters. And this is why I think in his late work he develops a more substantial understanding of the political, uh, which is. 
uh, an understanding which connects it to his concept of oikophilia. So he realized uh, through the concept of oikophilia that the human being is someone who uh, is uh, able to establish uh, himself as, as uh, one who belongs to a particular place in the universe. And that uh, is uh, reflected in his own uh, choices in his own life when he established the family in the countryside, in the village, uh, and in the in the in the uh, cottage that he bought and uh, brought up his children there and lived the life of ordinary um, uh, villagers, country people, uh, while also uh, uh, writing his over. So in a way, his uh, practical choices in his life and his reflective life uh, became uh, harmonical as opposed to those uh, leftist intellectuals he criticized uh, in, uh, in a famous book of him about the left, about the leftist intellectuals, i.e. that they lost this uh, uh, contact to this uh, natural environment that they were born into. I think there's so much one wants to talk about when it comes to Roger's work. And, and one aspect I think is, that's worth exploring more is the transcendence and his later turn to religion and how that ties into the aesthetic. And we're hoping to arrange a conference to uh, any listeners. Um, we're hoping to arrange a conference in Budapest next year on Roger's religious philosophy. And, and I think that would be an opportunity to explore the relation between transcendence and the aesthetic more. Well, what would you recommend if someone was to start out reading Roger and they want to understand his aesthetic uh, thought, what would you recommend to start with of Roger's own work, aside from your own book, because I recommend that one already? Yes, this uh, one, my own book gives an overview of the development of his work and his ideas on art and politics. But uh, but you have to start out from this thinker if you want really uh, uh, the, the real one. So uh, the small book on beauty you mentioned already that's that's a good uh, uh, summary of his aesthetics. But if you are interested in architecture, he has got two books on architecture: the, the aesthetics of architecture as well as the book on the vernacular. But we did not have much time to talk about his music, which is crucial for him. And in that respect, uh, uh, I can uh, uh, advise the book on, on the ring, on Wagner's ring, as well as his uh, book on the Tristan. But perhaps the most interesting, uh, the most uh, 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 controversial as well, is his last book on um, the Parsifal, on Wagner's Parsifal, where his understanding of the human uh, uh, of the mission of the human being, which is to uh, arrive to the uh, recognition that, in fact, in our life, the most important thing is to find our uh, uh, offer to the others. And what we have to offer is ourself, and in particular, our suffering. He was writing that in the last year of his life, when he was actually suffering. And what he uh, understood through Wagner and, and, uh, and the story of Parsifal was that, in fact, suffering is not for nothing. It's something that you can make uh, uh, meaningful as soon as you realize that, in fact, by suffering, you are imitating the suffering of Christ. And although you will not never become uh, God, and therefore you, you have no idea what is beyond, yet uh, the, the suffering that you experience can be offered to the others. And that's uh, how you can, in fact, turn that suffering meaningful because it helps the other. It gives them strength if they see that you are um, uh, able to do that. And it helps them also because uh, they will realize their own uh, suffering uh, as something that they can handle. So I think that uh, this book on Wagner is a very important one. Although I have got some problems uh, with its concept of love, uh, because uh, that uh, is in a way a demanding uh, concept in, in this last book, as opposed to the earlier one where the erotic had a, a close connection with this uh, an, a Christian dimension of love. In this late book, uh, uh, he seems to be turning away from the erotic, giving up 
that part of the human experience as a kind of um, a sacrifice. And that's a, another term that he uh, uh, makes use of. And of course, in, in Parsifal's uh, case, we see that he himself sacrifices himself. He does not give over to uh, bodily love in order to be able to to uh, send that message, which is crucial for Wagner uh, in his case too. This was the last work of the uh, of the musician. So uh, suffering and sacrifice, uh, in a way, uh, 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 is uh, pushing into the shadow the erotic dimension. That's that's the one uh, problem that I have in this last work. But otherwise, it's uh, a, a very great achievement of the late Scruton, because it shows us that uh, that art is, a, a, in fact, a way to uh, philosophize about the transcendental and about God himself. Look, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for joining us today. I think you're an inspiration to us all in working, you know, in thinking with Roger Scruton rather than just reading Roger Scruton. I think you're part of a first generation that are are really critically uh, examining Roger's work in an academic fashion, and I hope many more follow you in that. So thank you very much for, for joining us today, and I look forward to following you more on Twitter and uh, all your work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Clark Gustana, and I'm also grateful for you and also for all other students of, of, of Roger, because I see that, that you... To uh, together try to to keep that memory alive, and I appreciate that.